The new audio drama Tempest Runner has been out for a few days now. Like every major Star Wars story, it has plenty of fun facts, callbacks to other stories, Legends connections, and even some potential references to other franchises like Predator and Star Trek. I had some help putting this list together from Marv and his blog Numidian Prime, which I'll link to in the description, but let's go ahead and dive in. The story picks up about three months after the events of The Rising Storm and the defeat of the Dringir as seen in the High Republic comic. It also takes place after Out of the Shadows, and developments from that book lead to Lorna Dee's capture by the Jedi and the Republic in Tempest Runner. Several characters from the Star Wars Insider short stories about Starlight Beacon appear, including Velko Jahan and Gal Tarpfin. The story begins on the planet Sran and the Ash Worlds. Sran is from Alliance Intelligence Reports, while its placement in the Ash Worlds, an area of space that comes from Timothy Zahn's story in the first issue of the Tales comic, was established by the Essential Atlas Online Companion. A Nile character attempts to order Tovash and Juma Juice from a bar. Groovy and Tovash was first mentioned in Adventure Journal, and Juma Juice comes from the Legends Jedi Quest books. The Republic's Firebird Squadron flies out of Aurora 9, which first appeared in Light of the Jedi. One of their pilots just arrived from the Kalador system, which was the setting of a training mission in the game Rebel Assault. The Republic Defense Coalition recently fought the Nile on Karlak and in the Drighton Nebula. Karlak was the site of the snowy Death Watch camp in the Clone Wars, and the Drighton Nebula appeared in the game Rebel Assault 2. Lorna swears, Damn it to the Nightlands, which is a particularly interesting reference. For the 1990s and most of the 2000s, Ryloth in the Expanded Universe was a tidally locked planet, with one side in Eternal Day and the other in Eternal Night, with the Night side first termed as the Nightlands in Young Jedi Knights. This changed when the Clone Wars established Ryloth to have a normal planetary rotation, but clearly the Nightlands survive in some form. Star's End is also used as a swear several times. That was the name of a notorious prison originally created for Han Solo at Star's End back in 1979. Skier, Keeve Trinis, Tarek, and Serret all appear as part of the Jedi team who capture Lorna. They are all main characters in the Marvel High Republic comic, which is also written by Kevin Scott. While fighting the Nile, Skier says, I have had enough of this. I don't know if this was intentional or not, but the delivery reminded me of Star Trek III The Search for Spock when Captain Kirk tells the Klingon Commander Krug, I have had enough of you. And in another potential reference to outside franchises, Trandoshan culture has always shared some similarities with Predator culture. A Nile claims to have heard about Trandoshans ripping out the spines of their victims, which is something we see in the Predator films. The Nile character Tasia is a Cathar, a cat-like species originally from the Tales of the Jedi comics. More significantly, she speaks with the same accent as fellow Cathar Juhani from Knights of the Old Republic. Tasia speculates on where the Republic might send their prisoners, with Jubilar being one place she mentions specifically. Jubilar and its penal colonies come from The Last One Standing, the Boba Fett story in Tales of the Bounty Hunters, and it recently got a small shout-out in The Mandalorian. After her capture, Lorna identifies Tarpfin as either Ex Mon Calamari Royal Guard or Dak Ballet. Akbar was captain of the Guard in the Clone Wars, while the Dak Ballet presumably has some relation to the Mon Calamari Ballet going on in the background of the opera in Revenge of the Sith. Dak was one of the expanded universe names for the Mon Calamari homeworld until Mon Calo was settled on. We learn that Lorna D comes from the planet Aeoloth, a Twilight colony that's about to appear in the Life Day Treasury, which is also co-written by Kevin Scott. Aeoloth was originally settled during the time of the Sith Empire. Lorna's homeworld is in the Gallus Sector, which is the same sector as Ryloth, per the Essential Atlas. The sector was created for the Rebel Alliance sourcebook. In her first flashback scene, Lorna is riding Blurgs, a creature commonly shown as mounts in Star Wars stories. Lorna urges her family to mine for Rill, the same type of spice found on Ryloth back in Legends. Lorna and her friend Bala soon also discover spice spiders capable of producing glitter stem, a different variety of spice. Glitter stem and the spiders that produce it were introduced in Jedi Search on Kessel. When her family is attacked, Lorna's father says their safe room could contain a Lyertza, a word I probably just horribly mispronounced that was a traditional Twi'lek weapon first seen in the X-Wing Rogue Squadron comics. Zygerians come to Aeoloth and we see that they are still, quote, unofficially in the slave trade. When Lorna is sold into slavery, some of her companions worry that they will be fed to a Brazak, the gliding lizard mounts Zygerians can be seen using in the Clone Wars and the Bad Batch. Lorna is rescued by Apo Rancisis, who attempts to help her. His voice sounds very similar to how it sounded during his appearance in the original 2D Clone Wars series. 
Oppo has a Padawan named Dao. I believe this is the first time we've ever heard mention of any of his apprentices. Oppo and Lorna have a very similar conversation as Luke and Rey in The Last Jedi. When Oppo asks where she's from, she replies nowhere, and he claims everyone is from somewhere. Lorna spends some time at the Karita Military Academy, introduced by Jedi Search and mentioned in Solo. Out of the Shadows recently established it in the High Republic era. A significant amount of time is spent on the planet Arbra, which served as a rebel base for a decent chunk of the classic Marvel Star Wars comics. It's the homeworld of the Hujibs, who Cavan will soon be writing an adventures annual about. Quinn, another Nile prisoner, is a Bival, a species that showed up a couple of times in the Clone Wars. Proto Branch, the Bival homeworld, was visited in Cavan Scott's last audio drama, Dooku Jedi Lost. Lorna fights a colicoid member of Pan's Tempest. It's appropriate that you can hear droidica noises mixed in their sound design, since the species was first mentioned in Episode 1, The Visual Dictionary, as having designed the droids in their image. Rinza the Hutt demands spice shipments from Bala. Rinza has been teased in several of Cavan Scott's projects over the last few years, starting with Tales from Vader's Castle as being a particularly monstrous hut. Wet Bub, a Gungan Nile who died near the end of Light of the Jedi, gets an extended cameo in the flashback. Near the end of the story, an escape pod is reported to be found floating in the Darknell systems. Darknell was the setting of Timothy Zahn and Michael Stackpole's short story, Interlude at Darknell. And that's it for this video. If he hasn't already posted it, Marv is certain to have an even more in-depth dive into all the random planets and species and other connections on his blog soon, which I will link to in the description. If you're interested in listening to Tempest Runner for yourself, check it out on Audible. You can get it for free with an Audible trial by following the link in the description or by visiting www.audibletrial.com slash Star Wars Explained. It's got a full voice cast, great sound design, music, and I think even some original music for Lorna, which I thought was cool. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel to keep up with all our High Republic and Star Wars coverage, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and consider checking out our Patreon page. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.